TUC Radio, San Francisco. Time of Useful Consciousness. Monsanto versus Percy Schmeiser. In early summer of 1997, the Canadian power company in Bruno, Saskatchewan, sprayed the herbicide Roundup at the base of their power poles, adjacent to the fields of canola grower Percy Schmeiser. An investigator for Monsanto the giant multinational agrochemical company, drove down the road a few days later and noticed that some of the plants had not been killed by the herbicide. He brought the plants in for a lab test and found they were Roundup-ready canola, a genetically modified organism or GMO engineered and patented by Monsanto. Even though Schmeiser's fields away from the road were free from contamination, and it became clear that the seeds for the plants in the ditch had fallen from a neighbor's truck, Monsanto filed a lawsuit against Percy Schmeiser on August 6, 1998. The Schmeiser case has become one of the most watched and most important cases for organic farmers, seed savers, for the movement against the invasion of the biosphere by genetically modified organisms and against corporate ownership of life. Canada and the U.S. are the only industrialized countries that place no restrictions on the planting and use of GMOs, and their agricultural trade has already suffered when their exports are being rejected because they contain GMOs. At the end of a multi-year battle, Schmeiser finally won a partial victory in Canada's Supreme Court. The court decided that he owes Monsanto no money in damages or court costs, but that he did infringe on Monsanto's rights as a patent holder. Today, even Monsanto has to admit that its genetically engineered canola, corn, and soy does cross-pollinate over long distances and can become a dominant trait in organic crops and wild relatives or become a weed along roadsides, in gardens, parks, and cemeteries that is almost impossible to eradicate. Percy Schmeiser, undaunted by his limited victory in the Canadian Supreme Court, says he believes that Due to that very ruling, Monsanto will face huge liability issues down the road. He said, The court determined that they have ownership to the plant and that I infringed by having it in my field. With ownership comes responsibility, and I assume more lawsuits will be filed against them for the contamination of other farmers' fields. End of quote and he makes that challenge against Monsanto right now, as you will hear in a moment. 
I recorded Percy Schmeiser in November 2006 in Ukiah, California. He and his wife of 55 years, Louise, had returned to an area that passed in 2004 a measure making it the first county in the nation to ban the growing of genetically altered crops and animals. Monsanto could not have chosen a more formidable opponent. Here is Percy Schmeiser reporting on his legal battles with Monsanto. It's not easy for anyone to stand up to a corporation, and my wife and I really found that out when Monsanto laid a lawsuit against us in 1998 and was a patent infringement lawsuit. As some of you know, I do come from the province of Saskatchewan, the heart of the prairies and basically in the heart of the grain growing area of Western Canada. But coming from there, we are also very closely associated with farmers in North Dakota and also Montana, Idaho and our neighboring province of, of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Back there, Louise and I were known for as a seed developer, especially in canola, which we had, I st when I took the family farm over from my father in 1947, we immediately started growing, I should say I immediately started growing um, canola. At that time, it was known as rapeseed. And if I look back at that time, uh, rapeseed primarily, I, I would say half my production was for lubricating oil and the other half for cooking oil. It was not good for cooking oil at that time because of the uricic acid content, which was very high in rapeseed, and which then the cooking oil was quite bitter. My wife and I were married in 1952. She also came from a farm background, and immediately she started to help develop various varieties of canola. Uh, so we were known on the prairies as seed developers and seed savers, like hundreds of thousands of farmers we used our seed from year to year. Now, in 1996, uh, a lot of people were not aware of what happened, especially farmers, in regards to what happened when the government of Canada and also the U.S. government gave regulatory approval for the introduction of GMOs, genetic modified organisms. And there were four principal crops that were given regulatory approval at that time, and that was cotton, BT cotton, corn or maize and uh, soybeans and canola. And if I look back at what people were told at that time, the farmers were told, first of all, increased yields, a bigger yielder, and also that uh, it would be more nutritious, and the third thing, less chemical use. And I think when I talk to farmers, the issue of less chemical use is what really caught the ear, because uh, chemicals are a costly input to farmers, and a lot of farmers realized after half a century, especially since the Second World War in 1947 when they were introduced in our area, uh, the damage it was doing to the environment and also what it was doing to human health. And so that was the beginning, 1996. Now, in 1998, uh, Monsanto laid this lawsuit against my wife and myself, and it was a patent infringement lawsuit. And it was a real surprise when we got this lawsuit, when we, it was sent to us, and I didn't even take the time really to look at it because it was right in harvest time that we received this lawsuit, and when we had a little rainy period, I looked at it and I thought, gee, this doesn't look good. And I took it to my lawyer and he says, Percy, I think you're in trouble. And little did we know how much trouble it would be for many years afterwards. And in that lawsuit, it said that we were growing Monsanto's GMO canola without a license from them and that we had infringed on their patent. And that really concerned us because, as I said at that time, we didn't even know about anything that a, uh, that a gene had been patented and put into a canola seed where they could claim ownership. Also in that lawsuit, they had stated that we uh, probably maybe had gotten the seed illegally. And, but, so we stood up to Monsanto, and to make a long story short, it then went to Federal Court of Canada, because most patent laws come under federal jurisdiction. And so we had no choice of where the case could be heard, or would be heard. Federal Court of Canada, one judge. 
And as I've said many times, how we wish that we could have had a judge and jury with farmers on that knew and understood about farming, but that was not to happen. And in the two years of pretrial, uh, Monsanto withdrew all allegations that we had ever obtained a seed illegally and that that didn't matter. The fact that they had found some of their GMO canola plants not even in our field, but in the ditch alongside of one of our fields. And that was in 1998 when that lawsuit was, uh, was launched. We had eight fields seeded to canola in 1998, uh, amounting to about 1,030 acres. And it was only that it was noticeable in the, one, in the ditch along one field. So that is where the contamination came from. It came from a neighbor because he grew Monsanto's GMO canola in 1996, the first year that it was introduced, and also another neighbor grew it in 1997. And we never knew that these people or my neighbors had ever grown it until our trial in 2000, the year 2000. That's the basis then. Patent infringement, Monsanto claiming it doesn't matter how it gets there, you violate their patent if this happens. Now, there were many things that the trial judge ruled and, and, and in his various judgments, but the most important one was where he said it does not matter how Monsanto's GMOs, genetic modified organisms, gets into any farmer's fields or into his soil. And he did go on to say how this could happen. Cross-pollination was one, direct seed movement by seeds blown in the wind, especially transportation by farmers, and also birds, bees, wind, floods, whatever. And he said if that happens, a farmer no longer owns his seeds or plants. They become the ownership of Monsanto. Well, that was really, it was unbelievable, that ruling. And he went on to say that we were not allowed to use our seeds or plants after being, we had been working on them and developing them for over 50 years. To give you some examples of what we were able to accomplish, there were two major diseases on the prairies in canola, and that was serotina and black leg. And we could continuously seed canola in the same land year after year, whereas the companies were saying once every four years in the same land. So that was one of the major accomplishments. The judge ruled that all that research and development also goes to Monsanto because of the contamination. Well, that was heartbreaking. He also ruled that all the profit from 1,030 acres, which we have seeded, goes to Monsanto. He also ruled that the level of contamination did not matter. And to give you an example, as I said, we had seeded 1,030 acres in 1998. We used about 9,000 pounds of seed, and it is estimated that the total contamination by Monsanto in our seed supply was from 10 to 15 pounds in 9,000 pounds. And yet, through their patent law, it didn't matter, the judge said, what the rate of contamination was. It all goes to Monsanto. Now, the University of Manitoba at Winnipeg, some of their scientists went and checked all of our eight different fields. And in two fields, they found absolutely no contamination. And what did the judge rule on even those fields? He said, because we were seed savers and because we were using our seed from year to year, there was a probability there could be some of Monsanto's GMOs in those fields also. That also becomes the ownership of Monsanto, even on a probability, because we were using our seeds, as I said, from year to year. So that was the trial judge. Then we proceeded on <clears throat> to the Federal Court of Appeal. Now we've got three judges. And what did the three judges rule after another two years of legal battle? They ruled that although they did not agree with all of the trial judges decision, they still would uphold it. And normally in court, it should have been thrown out if you don't agree with all of the trial judge's decision because it could have a real bearing on the results of that trial or the first judge's decision. So what do we have left? Four years of legal battle or $300,000 in costs. We had one avenue left, and that's the Supreme Court of Canada. But anyone who loses two trials in a row, it's very unlikely that a Supreme Court will hear the case. 
And mostly they say the odds are about 10% that the Supreme Court would hear the case. And it was the best news in our life when the Supreme Court ruled in our favor to hear the case. Now, in the Supreme Court, we could also bring up other items besides patent infringement. And some of those other items we could bring up was, first of all, can farmers keep the ancient right of being able to use their seed and develop their own seed from year to year? And uh, there's some other ones, and maybe I should just refer to them. Can living organisms, seeds, plants, genes, and human organs be owned and protected by corporate patents on intellectual property? And then another one, can genetic modified traits invade or become noxious weeds that then become resistant to weed killers. We now have super weeds on the prairies and the northern plains of the U.S. And I'll go into a little later what a super weed is. But the most important one by that time after five years of battle was that who owns life? Has anyone the right to patent any higher life form including even a human being? So that's what the Supreme Court had to address. This is what the Supreme Court ruling was. I should also say that in the meantime, about after four years of battle, Monsanto laid another lawsuit against us, which a lot of people don't know. And that lawsuit was for a million dollars for their court costs up to that time. So we had to fight also a million dollar lawsuit and uh, also the patent infringement case. So that is what came up before the Supreme Court. Now, if we would have lost, now I should maybe say, what did the Supreme Court rule? They said that on the issue, I did not have to pay Monsanto one cent. And Monsanto had light, wanted license fees, damages, a million-dollar court cost. And in that million-dollar court cost, it was very unusual. They said the reason that they wanted me to pay their court cost is because I was stubborn, I was arrogant, and I wouldn't do what Monsanto wanted. But a million-dollar a battle there. So the Supreme Court ruled I didn't have to pay Monsanto no money. But what was not fair, remember Monsanto laid the lawsuit against us and they had testified throughout all the trials that it was a test case for them to see how far they could exercise patent infringement law over farmers' rights. So they should have paid all of the court costs because they lost everything they came after me. But the court ruled, I pay my cost, and they pay their cost. Their cost for legal fees up to that time, disbursements and so on, was around $2 million. Louise and I, our court cost was around $400,000. Well, believe me, it's a lot easier for a corporation to pay $2 million in for legal fees on a test case versus a farmer standing up for his rights to pay $400,000. So that part was not fair. Now, on the issue... On the issue of who owns life, can you patent a higher life form? This is what the Supreme Court ruled. Number one, it doesn't matter how Monsanto's genes uh, get into any higher life forms. And if this happens, Monsanto owns and controls that higher life form. Now think about that. Doesn't matter how in one life form from another life form gets into a life form. So that was what the ruling, Monsanto owns and controls that higher life form. So where does it stop now? A bird, a bee, seeds or plants, ultimately even a human being. The Supreme Court went on to say Monsanto owns and controls that higher life form. But maybe in the Supreme Court's wisdom, maybe it's now come home to haunt Monsanto because we now have a liability issue. Because if you own and control a higher life form, and you release it into the environment where you cannot control it, they are now liable for the damage that they have done or, or the harm they have caused. Now, already there are many lawsuits against Monsanto on the liability issue, mostly by the organic farmers of Saskatchewan in a class action lawsuit against Monsanto because of choice being taken away Organic farmers no longer can grow several crops like soybeans or canola because our total seed supply is now contaminated. What happened after that? Okay, that's the Supreme Court's decision. They also stated that it should go back to the Parliament of Canada, in other words, to the people of Canada, to sort out 
and pass laws to protect the rights of people and farmers against patent law or patent infringement law, and also who owns life. On May 1st in 2006, Louise and I took our case to the United Nations Human Rights Commission in Geneva. It was a violation of human rights with the introduction of GMOs. And in some of the submission to the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations at Geneva was this. First of all, it was that the violation, a drastic violation of human rights for the average person because we do not have labeling. We don't know what we're eating. We don't know what we're feeding our children or grandchildren. So that's a drastic violation of human rights when you don't know what's in your food. And it stands the same in both our countries. Many countries of the world, including all of the European Union, have labeling. People know what they are eating. There were other issues we brought forward, but the whole issue about who can patent life and so on. Now, Canada has been charged with this, drastic violations in Canada. Since May, they still have not replied to the charges, and we're still waiting to see about that. To further now, where does it stand again with my relationship to Monsanto? It's not been good. Um, (laughs) uh, In all this process, they threaten us a lot of times. In fact, at one point before the Supreme Court decision, they tried through liens and caveat, they tried to seize our farm equipment, they tried to seize all of our farmland, they tried to seize our house, and we had to fight every bit of that. They tried to destroy us and take away our ability to put mortgages on our farm to fight or to pay our legal bills. So what happened? Last year, I should say we've now rented all our land out except a quarter section, 160 acres, and my wife and I decided to go back and try and do new research in yellow mustard to try and develop a higher yielding yellow mustard. And so last year we had a quarter section of land, but we used 50 acres of it, where in 2005 we grew no crop on it cultivation only to maintain and control any weeds that may be grown to try that we could seed yellow mustard in 2006. When I came home from California last October, I went out to the farm, and here I see canola plants growing on this field where there should be nothing growing. And so immediately, with testing, we found out that they were Monsanto's canola plants, GMO plants growing on a field that should have nothing growing on. We notified Monsanto. They did come out. They checked some of the plants where we had tested. Two days later, they confirmed it was their GMO canola on our field again. Today yet, we don't know if it was intentionally or unintentionally. So they said to us, what would you want done with this field? And I said, we want all the canola plants removed by hand. And they agreed to that, that they would do this immediately. But then they said, you have to sign a release form. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, I said, in the Supreme Court, in the Federal Court, Court of Appeal, you never said anything about a release form. You only said that all a farmer has to do, notify you, and you'll come out and remove any offending plants. So it didn't say okay immediately. They said, we will send you the release form. My wife happened to be the first person to look at the message on the fax machine. And and when I come in the door, I knew something was wrong because I'd never seen her so angry for a long time. And she said, you won't believe what Monsanto sent us. I said, what is it? So she gives me what the release form is. Here's what was in that release form that they wanted us to sign. Number one, my wife and I or any members of our family could never ever take Monsanto to court again for the rest of our life. And secondly, if we had any other contamination in following years, it was our responsibility to remove it or they could fine us for it. And number three, which was really the one that really made us upset, we would have to sign a non-disclosure statement that we could never talk to the press, never talk to our neighbors what the terms of settlement were. So we said, no way. And then Monsanto said, we will not remove the plants. I then, with the help of two neighbors, we removed the plants, three truckloads of them. We notified Monsanto the days we would be doing this to come out if they wanted to watch. They said they wouldn't. 
So we notified Monsanto when we were finished. I said, your property is on a pile on, in our field. Come in and get it. They said, no, we won't. I said, okay, that gives me three choices. I can burn it or I can load it on a semi and haul it to Saskatoon and dump it on your head office doorstep. <laughs> and they basically they said, don't you dare. So anyway, what we did then is that we just left it, and it's still on a pile on my farm today yet. So in the meantime, we got a letter from Monsanto's lawyer and said it would be in our best interest not to seed mustard in it in 2006 because of the contamination. So we, I realized that you cannot separate canola from mustard. And so we didn't seed uh, mustard in that field this year. We seeded uh, wheat and oats. So even our choice of what we could seed was taken away and them even saying. So the bill came to about $620 to, that I had to pay my neighbors for helping. So this year, I sent Monsanto a bill, $620. And I got a letter back that they will not pay it because they, I didn't sign the release. So then a month ago, or a little better than a month ago, I went to small claims court. <laughs> and I asked the judge that I would like to get Monsanto into court, and he said, send Monsanto another notice. So I followed his orders and give them 10 days. 10 days later, they still didn't reply. And so then uh, two weeks ago today, in fact, Friday, two weeks ago today, Monsanto was issued a summons for $620, and I'll have them in court. So it's not the issue of the $600. The whole issue now is the liability issue. And if I win that suit against Monsanto, there will be thousands of farmers that can do the same thing because in Saskatchewan, you can have an amount up to $10,000 that you can take Monsanto to court. So that it's a whole issue of liability. I should also add, uh, add it's not only 620 it's 640 because there's a $20 court fee. So, so, <laughs> but it's the issue. That was Percy Schmeiser, a Canadian farmer from Bruno, Saskatchewan. He took over the family farm in 1947. He and his wife are known on the prairies as seed savers. Over 50 years, they developed a canola seed resistant to disease and lost their life's work by contamination from genetically modified canola. When TUC Radio returns, Percy Schmeiser shares the stage with Ignacio Chapella from UC Berkeley. In October 2000, Chapella discovered the contamination of Mexican corn with Monsanto GMO corn. They will talk about the health issues of food prepared with GMO plants. What does it do to our bodies when we eat proteins, viral and bacterial material, and pesticides that are incorporated into the DNA of GMO plants? Visit TUC Radio's website at www.tucradio.org. That's tucradio.org for links to Percy Schmeiser's website and more information. Please find a pen to write down a phone number for information on how to order a CD or audio tape of this talk by Percy Schmeiser and Ignacio Chapella. This program is also available as film on DVD. TUC Radio is free to all radio stations. Your CD, tape, or DVD order is our only support and is essential in keeping us on the air. Call us toll-free anytime at 877-TUC-TAPE for information on how to order. You can get your tape or CD or DVD with Percy Schmeiser by mail or credit card by phone or on the web. Our toll-free phone number 877-TUC-TAPE translates into 1-877-882-882. 
My name is Maria Geleiden. Thank you for listening. Give us a call. TUC Radio, San Francisco. Time of Useful Consciousness. Monsanto versus Percy Schmeiser. When Percy Schmeiser took over the 1,400-acre family farm near Bruno, Saskatchewan, in 1947, he was only 16 years old. He became a successful farmer and respected mayor of his town. He and his wife are known on the Canadian prairies as seed savers. Like thousands of other farmers, they were replanting their own seed from year to year. Over 50 years, they developed a canola seed that was resistant to disease and then lost their life's work by contamination from Monsanto's genetically modified canola. Schmeiser can no longer grow his canola because both his land and his seed stock are now contaminated by Roundup-ready canola that was grown by a neighbor. Roundup-ready canola is engineered and patented by Monsanto, the giant multinational agrochemical company. Schmeiser is not the only one who suffered damage. Today, most of the canola acreage in western Canada is contaminated with Monsanto's patented canola. Exports are rejected by the many countries across the world that are refusing to import genetically modified grains. Within the European Union, laws are being considered that would force farmers who grow genetically modified crops to pay a fee per acre to create a fund from which to compensate farmers when their crops get contaminated. One would assume that Percy Schmeiser was compensated by his neighbor or by Monsanto for the damage done to his land and seed. But in Canada, much like in the U.S., laws are supporting the ownership rights of corporations. The courts decided that Monsanto owns not only their engineered canola, but any other living organism that is invaded by their gene. The possible consequences are difficult to imagine. Monsanto now gains ownership of other plants that their GMO canola cross-pollinates, which includes related species such as yellow mustard or wild relatives of those plants. And what about living organisms other than plants? You heard in part one of this program, in Schmeiser's own words, how he and his family survived that six-year ordeal in the courts. In today's program, you will hear why coexistence with traditional seeds is impossible. Here's Percy Schmeiser. I'd like to go into two important issues. The issue of containment. Once you introduce GMOs, you cannot contain it. You cannot contain wind, pollen flow, or, or transportation, whatever, and it will and it'll move. The other important issue, there is no such thing as coexistence. And the GMO gene is the dominant gene and spread into whatever species of seeds or plants that it gets into, and it becomes dominant. So you lose biodiversity, you lose your indigenous seeds, pure seeds, heirloom seeds, and so on. So there is no such thing as coexistence. And when I go to Europe, and i just been in Europe two months ago, and they're still talking about coexistence, and the farmers still have choice. You no longer have choice. And I often think, 
how often I talk to organic farmers, and I think up to about two years ago, organic farmers didn't realize how serious the situation was with the introduction of GMOs, that they could wake up tomorrow morning and not realize that they're no longer an organic farmer or a conventional farmer, especially if your seeds and plants are taken away on you. So no coexistence and no containment. There's also the issue of terminator genes, uh, which is now the, the real hot issue on the northern plains and the prairies of western Canada, where the Monsanto now wants to introduce the terminator gene. Before that, it was Delta and Pine Company Limited, where the seeds from a plant are now sterile, and you cannot use them for the following year. And I think that's the greatest assault on life that we've ever seen on the face of this planet. Imagine a corporation coming out with a seed that is sterile, that you have no future life from it. The danger of that, it can also uh, spread under certain conditions into your neighbor's crop and render his crop to some degree sterile also. Really the name for it is GERTS, or Genetic Use Restriction Technology. That's GERTS, but the farmers have given it the name of the terminator. We also now have the cheater gene, two genes, and you hear very little about the cheater gene, and it's also used in conjunction with the terminator gene. And what is the cheater gene? Both genes are put into a seed. When the seed becomes a plant, with the cheater gene in, the plant will not produce a seed unless you spray a chemical on it. And after the, you spray the chemical on, the plant will produce a seed, then the terminator gene will basically kick in and render that seed sterile. That is what is out there. And, the, and Monsanto has been trying very hard especially in third world countries, to try to commercialize the Terminator gene. It has not been allowed in North America, and hopefully we can keep it not being allowed all over the world. So that's another very important issue, an issue that is really breaking down our, our world social fabric, where Monsanto advertises that if you think your neighbor is growing GMO soybeans or canola, or whatever, without a license, inform, squeal, or rat on your neighbor to Monsanto. Another thing that they will do, if a farmer's not at home, if they don't know the far farmer's mailing address, they'll go to the lo local municipality or county, as you call them, and get the farmer's land location. Then they'll use a small plane or a helicopter. They'll fly over a farmer's field, and we generally, our fields are 160 acres. Center of the field, they'll drop a Monsanto herbicide spray bomb in the center, normally, of each field of the farmers. And then they'll fly back after about a week or 10 days after the chemical has time to activate, and they'll see, look and see what has happened. If the canola field where they hit with the spray bomb, the herbicide spray bomb, has died, they know the farmer was not using Monsanto's GMO canola. If the canola field where they hit didn't die, they know the farmer was using Monsanto's GMOs. I won't go on too much longer, but the economic issue has been devastating. Farmers were told back in on the northern plains and the prairies of western Canada in 1996 increased yields less chemicals, and more nutritious. We'd now be able to feed a hungry world. We'd now have sustainable agriculture. What has happened with the introduction of GMOs? The yields have gone down drastically in soybeans and canola. The nutritional content is only maybe 50% of what it was before. But most of all, we have a massive increased use of chemicals, of mutants that have developed, and superweeds. I mentioned before superweeds, and I'll explain what a superweed is. A superweed is a regular conventional canola plant. Monsanto was not the only company in 1996 to start selling GMO canola. You had other varieties like Liberty Link, Pursuit Smart, and Roundup Ready canola. Within the first year of the introduction, you had a cross-pollination of those three GMO uh, canola crops into one regular conventional canola plant, now taking a multitude of chemicals to try and kill that new superweed. The superweed is not only in canola fields now, it has spread into our wheat fields, our barley fields, into our towns, our road allowances, our golf courses, our cemeteries. It is all over now, a new added expense 
for everyone with this new super weed. Now they have come out with a new, more powerful, a highly toxic chemical to try and control the new super weed. So what has this all meant to us? It's meant a control of the seed supply and a massive use and, uh, of, new, of new chemicals and more powerful chemicals, chemicals and more chemicals. More danger to the environment and harm to the environment and human health. I don't want to go on much longer, but one thing I would like to say, we now have two major results with the introduction of GMOs. First of all, the GMOs themselves, the harm to human health and the increased use of chemicals. Now, Monsanto this past year had to release to the British government their own testing on their herbicide Roundup. Monsanto used to say in North America, Roundup was so safe, it was safer than t a table salt, you could even drink it. But what did Monsanto's own testing reveal and which they had to produce for the British government was this. First of all, it's a blood disruptor, which means increased rates of tumors, cancer-causing tumors, especially in young people, in growing organs. Number two, it's, it lowers a human's immune system. Number three, kidney and liver ailments. Number four, rashes and eczemas. This is what Monsanto's own testing revealed to the British government when they were telling us all the while it was safe. I won't go into the environmental, but I would like to say one thing on the food issue. When you transfer a gene from one life form to another, you can never move that gene by itself. You have to use a promoter or vector. And what are these promoters or vectors? They are either a bacteria or a virus, in the case of canola, antibiotic resistant marker gene. So when you eat a GMO food, you're not only eating a gene that prevents that plant from dying if you spray Roundup on it, but you're eating a virus or a bacteria that was never in your food before. So again, I'd like to close this way. My wife and I are very concerned, especially because of the fact that we have five children of our own. We have 15 grandchildren. We have a great-grandchild on the way at the present time. What kind of a legacy are we going to leave? And all of us leave to our children and our grandchildren. A legacy of land and air and water full of poisons. And I think none of us want that kind of legacy. Back in 1996, we didn't know what could happen with the introduction of GMOs. At least you have that knowledge. And the choice that you make here will be your choice. And down the road, you cannot say, we didn't know. So always remember that when you introduce it into any plant, most plants come from a family of plants. It will spread into, also into that family. Canola comes from the brassica family. And it's already spread to radishes, turnips, cauliflower, and so on. Remember, in closing, there is no return. You introduce GMOs, and it's over. Again, it's a great pleasure to come to California and bring you this message. I've spent a lot of time in California in the last five years, as well as other parts around the world. And as long as my wife and I have life in us, we gave a commitment back in 1998 that we would always stand up and we would go down fighting for the rights of farmers, always to use their seed from year to year. If you give up that right, you're back to a feudal and a surf system. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity. That was Percy Schmeiser, recorded in November 2006 in Ukiah, California. He is the Canadian farmer who became an international symbol and spokesperson for independent farmers' rights. Next, you will hear from the UC Berkeley biologist and ecologist Ignacio Chapella. Chapella and Schmeiser share a common story. In October 2000, Chapella discovered the contamination of Mexican corn with Monsanto's GMO corn. Even though at that time GMO corn was not allowed to be planted anywhere in Mexico, the Monsanto corn gene was found inside the DNA of heirloom corn plants in a remote region of Oaxaca. When Chapella published his findings in the prestigious journal Nature, 
he almost lost his teaching position at UC Berkeley. Chapella begins with an overview of the state of the primary GMO crops, corn, soy, rice, and canola. He mentions in passing the two main traits that have been engineered into the plants. By herbicide resistance, he's referring to the plants such as the Roundup-resistant canola that invaded Schmeiser's field that will not die when sprayed with an herbicide. The other trait he's referring to is the Bt toxin trait. These are engineered plants that contain a pesticide in every part of the plant, making them unattractive or even deadly to insects. Humans can't taste the Bt toxin, but we are taking it in with our food. We have 30 years of experience with this now. And I think with the 30 years of experience, the four crops that Percy pointed out, the two traits that continue to be the mainstay of the industry, which are herbicide resistance and insecticide production by these plants, the BT, so-called BT toxin manipulation, we know that that generation of GMOs is pretty much bankrupt. And I think I say that confidently. It is bankrupt biologically. It's a bad idea. It doesn't work. It is bankrupt environmentally. The uh, application of chemicals continues to increase. Some of these herbicides, like atrazine, are banned in Europe. Since 2003, at least, the BBC documented um, Monsanto having to sell something called Roundup AZ. And the little AZ stood for atrazine. So we've gone back to chemistries that are really bad for the environment. So biologically, it's bankrupt. Environmentally, it's bankrupt. Financially, it's bankrupt, at least since 1999, certainly by 2000. Anybody who knew anything on this field was pulling their money away from it, putting it, putting it quietly somewhere else. Socially, as Percy showed, we have sown a lot more social damage than any benefits that we, uh, uh, that we could have accrued from it. And, uh, and hunger hasn't gotten any better. We don't need any more biomass. We burn our food in our gasoline tanks. We use our food to pack, you know, those biodegradable noodles, the noodles that you use for packing. that are biodegradable. They're nice and cool because they're biodegradable, but what they are, they're Cheetos without the flavor. They're puffed up corn starch. So we use food to pack stuff. We use food to burn. And yet hunger hasn't gone away. So that was not where it was at. So that one generation of genetically modified organisms, which continues to be pushed to the rest of the world, uh, very dramatically in Africa right now, the Gates and the Rockefeller Foundations have just announced less than a month ago or a month ago the uh, initiation of a new green revolution based around introduction of GMOs into Africa. Uh, they're putting, as a first installment, approximately $140 million to go there and convince them that that's good. They call it educate them, right? Bring them up to speed to, the, uh, to, to modernity and so on and so forth with these old, clunky, bankrupt manipulations of life. Where is the advancing front, though? And I wanted to point out a few of the developing fronts. Um, there are new developments that are very hard to track and that will be very difficult to get people to become uh, energized by. One of them, to me the most important one probably, is the manipulation of microorganisms. Microorganisms and, of course, trees, fish, insects. This manipulation, it's not a technology, it's simply a manipulation, a fiddling with living things. This fiddling with them is so easy to do. The methods that, ha that were developed back in 72, 75, the early 80s, are so easy to apply that anybody in this room can do it in their backyard. So as many people as have their hands on this, there are so-called products or new ideas of what could be developed. And those ideas, ideas are all over, the, all over the place, phylogenetically, taxonomically. So while we're talking about agriculture, while we're talking about food and crops, we should be really aware that we're also talking by proxy, if you will, 
about all those developments. So what you did by, for example, by passing a resolution not to have um, environmentally released genetically modified organisms here, I'm sure most of you were thinking about corn and some um, grapevine and so on, but what you were also doing was slowing down and protecting your county from the introduction of all these other organisms that are not as sexy, if you will. They don't catch the attention of the media so much. But microbes, things that we don't see, are over 98% of the living world. That is where we are applying a lot of these manipulations. And there, the diversity of, of so-called products, the diversity of manipulations is really wide and really widespread, really hard to track. They are used for all kinds of applications, many of them very attractive. The idea, for example, of uh, using genetically modified organisms for um, bioremediation, cleaning up oil spills, cleaning up mine tills, and so on, is something that I'm sure many in this audience will find it harder to oppose. And I just wanted you to know not only hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars and growing is the biofuel domain. I'm very sad to report that Berkeley is trying to sell itself or herself, maybe that's a, an appropriate way of referring to it, um, herself to BP, which is now called Beyond Petroleum, who is getting three universities to lower their cost and lower their uh, uh, prurition about uh, selling themselves to BP for five, $500 million to establish a bio, so-called bio um, energy institute to do research on alternatives to fossil fuels, all the things that you hear every day on the radio, especially ADM drumming into your heads. But it is really, and we have a list of things that uh, our administrators would like us to do they're telling us what research to do and what research not to do to look good for BP. And there are the production of trees with less lignin so that they can be broken down easily or more easily to uh, produce ethanol. GMO trees, of course. The production of GMO grasses, the production of GMO microbes to break down these things. It's going to be really difficult to confront that new, new wave. It is here. It's not coming. It's right here. And I just wanted you to know, that's basically what I wanted to do, I want, just want you to know that there are those two fronts coming that will be a lot harder to, to fight with because many of our environmentalist friends are so in love with this idea that you will find it difficult politically. I want to stop there because I wanted to, um, to hear from you. I think it would be much better if you directed our discussions. Thank you. I have a question, and it's relating to the containment. You said it can't be contained, and it does cross-pollinate. The question is, it seems that since it's moving to different species, is there any reason that it would not move to every species of plant and every species of animals, as if there is just no protection now that it's loose? I, I want to say that as, as a biologist, I used to really cringe at the thought of this and, 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 and people talking like this. Even though, basically speaking, yes, we are all connected in a very real way because DNA is connected. And I think I changed a lot by doing some research for Measure M in Sonoma. I started reading about uh, what people in the medical profession doing um, with vaccines. There is a way of, pre of vaccinating people and animals uh, where you simply inject on a, an epithelium, either on your skin or inside, a DNA, just raw DNA. And that DNA is actually picked up by your cells, incorporated into your genome, and there is some expression locally of that, uh, that piece of DNA in your cells. I was really amazed to see, to see that happening in mammals, in humans, because... We have a lot of mechanisms to prevent that from happening. Imagine that we picked up any DNA floating around in the environment. We would start just expressing bacterial and plant traits, and you, know, you would start growing things on you. We have incredible, powerful policing mechanisms, if you will, molecular policing, 
within ourselves, within our tissues, in an organism that are always making sure that we are what we say on the label that we are, right? And not something else that is coming in. Yet, it's a difficult job. And it's so difficult, actually, that we have viruses that we have to fight every year. Every year you get DNA incorporated into your cells every time you get a flu or you get any other viral diseases. Viruses are particularly good at that. It's not surprising that we should be using viral DNA. In all these GMO constructs, the way we get that DNA to stick, to actually stay within the corn plant, that the corn plant is also trying to stay a corn plant, thank you very much, we use these pieces of DNA to stick, to shuttle the DNA that we want to foist upon the, 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 the corn plant. And it works. The amazing thing is that it would work, and it works because we are piggybacking, hijacking the viral sequences. So it's not just any kind of DNA. It's DNA that is actually really promiscuous, and it will move around. Certainly, it will move into bacteria, and viruses will pick it up. This is DNA that will be easily picked up by bacteria and viruses. So bacteria and viruses will act as a channel. You know, they will come, pick, it up, pick up the DNA here, and will move on into another organism and pass that on. So your suspicion kind of instinctually, I think, has a, the more we look, has a lot more biological substance to it. And I do worry, I do care a lot about the fact that what we're doing is we are turning everything into virus. We're viralizing the, the biosphere where it has taken very long evolutionary time to get to places where we have organisms that are really well determined and so on. For millions of years, we had life in the bacterial world and viral world that was not anywhere near what we consider to be normal world. And, and now we're kind of pushing evolution back to that place where DNA is a lot more promiscuous where you have a lot more of this horizontal gene transfer, and we have no idea what the consequences are. That was UC Berkeley biologist and ecologist Ignacio Chapella talking about the brave new future of genetically engineered organisms that may take us back in time in evolutionary history. He and Percy Schmeiser spoke to organic farmers in Ukiah, California in November 2006. Visit TUC Radio's website at www.tucradio.org That's tucradio.org for links to Percy Schmeiser's website and more information. Please find a pen to write down a phone number for information on how to order a CD or audio tape of this talk by Percy Schmeiser and Ignacio Chapella. This program is also available as film on DVD. TUC Radio is free to all radio stations. Your CD, tape, or DVD order is our only support and is essential in keeping us on the air. Call us toll-free anytime at 877-TUC-TAPE for information on how to order. You can get your tape or CD or DVD with Percy Schmeiser by mail or credit card by phone or on the web. Our toll-free phone number 877-TUC-TAPE translates into 1-877-882-8273. My name is Maria Geleiden. Thank you for listening. Give us a call.